Welcome to the second lecture in our two-part series on ventricular assist devices. For information regarding VAD components, physiology and patient assessment, please see the first lecture. In this presentation, we will review the common complications associated with these devices, as well as an approach to managing the VAD patient with hypotension, hemorrhage or cardiac arrest. Recall in lecture one, we discussed the assessment of the asymptomatic well patient with an implanted VAD. What if our old man was incapable of dancing and felt lightheaded every time he stood up from his chair? Worse still, what if he was pale, diaphoretic, and frankly, hypotensive? Hypotension in these patients can result from either VAD or non-VAD related pathology. It is beyond the scope of today's presentation to cover all the possibilities of hypotension in patients with ventricular assist devices. It goes without saying that like any mechanical or electrical device, pump failure is common and technical difficulties can arise. Particularly, the driveline can fracture and software faults can occur in the device controller. It is known that over time, the outflow or inflow conduits can kink and migrate. This especially happens in patients with destination therapy who have had their devices for many years. Of course, cardiac tamponade can occur at any time, but particularly this is of concern in the immediate post-operative period. Acute aortic valve incompetence can have dire consequences in these patients also. Before we go any further in this discussion, I want to impart the golden rule of VAD physiology to you. These devices are preload dependent and afterload sensitive. The VAD will only pump the volume of blood delivered to it. Therefore, the maintenance of preload is critically important to these patients. In this discussion, we're going to review the common causes of hypotension in the patient with ventricular assist devices. These causes include thrombosis, dysrhythmias, a phenomenon known as suction events, sepsis, and bleeding or hemorrhage, which will be discussed later. Thrombosis is a reasonably common occurrence in patients with ventricular assist devices, occurring at a rate of 1-2% to 2 over the first two years from implantation. Thrombi can occur within the VAD pump itself or either the inflow or outflow conduits. Embolization of these thrombi is a common occurrence. These led to considerable rates of cerebral ischemia and stroke particularly in the early generation of VADs. Patients, as a result of this, are commonly on dual antiplatelet therapy and anticoagulation to help attenuate the risk of stroke and peripheral embolization. VAD thrombosis presents with a low cardiac output state in a patient with poor systemic perfusion and low mean arterial pressures. Interestingly, the VAD controller will often record a falsely high pump flow rate. As mentioned earlier, echocardiography can be an important tool in the diagnosis of VAD thrombosis. In this instance, imagining left ventricular outflow obstruction, you will notice on echo the patient will have a big distended left and right ventricular system. Further investigation with contrast to CT may be helpful in making this diagnosis. The management of VAD thrombus is centered around urgent anticoagulation, typically with intravenous heparin and antiplatelet agents. There are case reports of intravenous thrombolysis being administered to patients with life-threatening VAD thromboses. However, if you are considering this, I'd strongly recommend liaising with your nearby VAD coordinator teams. 
Ventricular and atrial dysrhythmias are incredibly common occurrence in patients with VADs, typically occurring in up to 50% of patients. As I mentioned in Lecture 1, ventricular dysrhythmias are very well tolerated in these patients. There are many case reports throughout medical literature documenting clear cases of conscious VF in patients with VADs. Dysrhythmias in these patients can occur for various reasons. Let's not forget the significant underlying myocardial disease leading to the VAD being implanted in the first place. But local trauma from VAD components coming in contact with the endocardium or suction events can precipitate dysrhythmias. Interestingly, in a chicken and egg scenario, suction events can lead to dysrhythmias and vice versa, dysrhythmias can cause suction events, which we'll explain shortly. New cardiac ischemia, electrolyte disturbances, and hypovolemia can all cause dysrhythmias in these patients as well. The treatment algorithm for atrial dysrhythmias in these patients is no different than any other patient presenting to your emergency department. The management of ventricular dysrhythmias in these patients centres around volume replacement, considering a reduction in VAD pump speed and either pharmacological or electrical cardioversion. Remembering that ectopy can occur if the endocardium comes in contact with any VAD component in the same manner that you can create ventricular ectopics with overzealous placement of a guide wire in a central line, it's important to maintain left ventricular volume in the setting of ventricular dysrhythmias with these patients by the cautious administration of fluid boluses. Different drugs can be utilized to manage these ventricular dysrhythmias. Amiodarone is very successful and second line agents such as lignocaine and procainamide have also been used. It's important to note that electrical cardioversion in these patients is safe and if performed AP pad placement is preferred. Of interest some VADs do contain internal defibrillators. Once your patient arrives at their VAD coordinating centre their cardiologist may choose to alter the VAD pump speed but this typically takes place under transesophageal echo guidance taking into consideration the important data that's downloaded from the VAD. In continuous flow ventricular assist devices, large negative pressures can be generated within the left heart, causing the left ventricular chamber to collapse with resultant marked leftward displacement of the interventricular septum. This is known as a suction event. Not surprisingly, a suction event presents clinically in that of a low cardiac output state with low perfusion or mean arterial pressures and low VAD flow rates. The causes of suction events centre around that of preload failure. Hypovolemia would have to be the number one cause. However, new right ventricular failure from infarction or pulmonary hypertension can cause a suction event, as can new dysrhythmias and malposition of the inflow cannula. Recall this echo slide from the first presentation and note the largely distended akinetic or hypokinetic left ventricle with the significant space between the inflow cannula and both the left ventricular free wall and the septum. In this still image of a parasternal long axis, we can see a suction event taking place. Note the left ventricular cavity is almost 100% collapsed and there is obvious contact between the thickened interventricular septal wall and the tip of the VAD inflow cannula. In continuous flow VADs, a suction event can precipitate a severe ventricular dysrhythmia. As mentioned earlier, 
dysrhythmias can also lead to a suction event. So it's important to check the telemetry or a 12 lead ECG as soon as possible. The management of these suction events centers around the maintenance of preload. The administration of fluid boluses is crucial and then reassessment of and treatment of occurring dysrhythmias should also take place. As mentioned earlier, more challenging causes for suction events, including new right ventricular failure or pulmonary hypertension, should also be treated. This should occur in conjunction with your VAD coordinating team. And as previously mentioned, once these patients are safely at the VAD center, VAD pump speeds may be altered under the guidance of a toe probe. Sepsis is another common cause for hypotension in a patient with an implanted VAD. This occurs at a rate of about 42% within the first year from implantation. VAD infections can occur in any portion of the VAD, including its surgical site, the drive line, the device pocket, or within the pump itself. It goes without saying that it is associated with severe morbidity and mortality in these patients, and unfortunately will subsequently preclude further transplantation. Gram-positive organisms predominate on culture, especially coagulase negative staph and staph aureus. However, gram-negative organisms and fungi have also been implicated in VAD-related infections. Don't forget these patients spend a considerable amount of time in hospital and are also subject to acquiring hospital-acquired infections and multi-drug resistant organisms. Our role in the care of these patients should be to culture widely and to keep antibiotic coverage broad. Remember, these infections can be subtle and present purely as isolated hypotension or fever without localizing signs or symptoms. We will now move on to a different form of patient presentation, but a common occurrence for a shocked or unstable patient with a VAD. In my instance, this was a patient with a VAD implanted for myocarditis who had concomitant uterine fibroids and presented with torrential PV bleeding and hemorrhagic shock. Non-surgical bleeding is one of the most common adverse events to occur within the first month of VAD implantation. Bleeding is also the most common reason for these patients to present to the emergency department. Common sites of bleeding include the gastrointestinal tract, epistaxis, and unfortunately intracerebral hemorrhage and intrathoracic hemorrhage. The mechanism of bleeding in these patients is likely to be multifactorial. Firstly, these patients receive both anticoagulation and multi-antiplatelet therapy to attenuate the risk of thromboembolic events. Typically, these patients are on dual antiplatelet therapy and warfarin with a target INR of 2.0 to 2.5. Secondly, after prolonged implantation of a VAD, an acquired von Willebrand syndrome occurs. This is a result of high shear stresses on blood as they cycle through the device. Finally, the reduced pulse pressure associated with continuous flow VADs can lead to increases in AV malformations and angiodysplasias of the gastrointestinal tract. As a result, GI hemorrhage is the most common site of bleeding in these patients. The management of bleeding in a VAD patient is a challenging scenario which poses a difficult therapeutic dilemma. Standard volume resuscitation, just like any hemorrhaging patient, should take place with early referral for endoscopy if the gastrointestinal tract is identified as a possible source of bleeding in these patients. The reversal of anticoagulation in these patients may be required 
if hemorrhage control is difficult or life-threatening. The consideration of anticoagulation reversal should take place in discussion with the ventricular assist device coordinating team and the cardiologists at the VAD center. However, if it's chosen to be the appropriate therapy for the patient, different agents can be used to help reverse the multiple reasons for hemorrhage, including prothrombin complex concentrates, fresh frozen plasma, tranexamic acid, Desmopressin or DDAVP to assist in the acquired von Willebrand syndrome. And there are case reports of recombinant factor seven being used for life-threatening intracerebral hemorrhage in patients with VADS. We will now move on to the final challenging clinical scenario of how to manage a patient with a ventricular assist device in cardiac arrest. If a patient is unconscious, not breathing, and has no signs of VAD function, they should be assumed to be in cardiac arrest, and standard advanced life support measures should be undertaken. The priority here is to look for both patient and VAD-related factors that may have led to the cardiac arrest. A team member should be allocated to assess the function of the VAD and ensure that all its components are present and connected. This systematic approach is mentioned in the first lecture, but involves urgent auscultation over the precordium or subcostal region, listening for the continuous hum of a functioning VAD, whilst also checking the connections from the drive line to the controller, the controller to dual battery supply or wall power, and also checking the controller for the alarms and functions such as RPM, flow, and power. As we've discussed previously, dysrhythmias are common in these patients and early defibrillation and rhythm checks are essential. Bedside ultrasound or echocardiography can also provide crucial information as to the possible cause and reversibility of the arrest in these patients. Interestingly, VAD manufacturers often quote that chest compressions should only be performed if absolutely necessary in these patients. It is of course inappropriate to withhold advanced life support measures for patients in full cardiac arrest. But if return of spontaneous circulation is obtained, Damage to the VAD itself or physical dislodgement of outflow cannulae should be considered and the patient should be taken as soon as possible to a cardiothoracic center or the VAD coordinating center to help with repairs of these injuries should they have occurred. To summarize the management of cardiac arrest in a patient with a ventricular assist device, First and foremost, the identification of absence of signs of life and the absence of VAD function should precipitate the administration of advanced life support measures. This should include 100% oxygen with consideration of endotracheal intubation, minimal interruptions to closed chest compressions and early defibrillation of ventricular dysrhythmias, intravenous access and the administration of advanced life support drugs as indicated, and the addition of generous fluid boluses, remembering that these patients are exquisitely sensitive and dependent on their preload. That brings us to the end of our two-part discussion on ventricular assist devices. The important take-home messages I'd like to impart on you is that each patient with a ventricular assist device deserves a thorough examination. Being systematic in the patient assessment and their general appearance, a stepwise interrogation of the VAT itself, and a cautious assessment of their hemodynamic status. Don't be afraid to call for help early, particularly with the VAD coordinators at the transplant center Obtain a 12-lead ECG and make sure your patient is on telemetry always.
and consider the multiple reasons for hypotension and instability in these patients. Thank you for listening.